In this evening reflection for Lent in this Lenten series, I'd like to talk about a reality which all of us face many times in our life, the reality of suffering. We all know what suffering is. We're part of a suffering, bleeding, broken world. It's a human condition which we can't avoid. Even though we in the Western hemisphere, in the Western civilization, we like to do anything we can to eliminate suffering. Uh, whether that be an extreme case as people can drink themselves into oblivion or drug themselves into oblivion or unbridled sex, unbridled pressure, pleasures. Uh, we're not good at handling suffering. We'd rather avoid it. And of course, we don't look for suffering. We don't go out and look for it. We don't want to suffer. We're not masochists. But there is suffering that comes along that no matter what we do, we can avoid. It's there. So the question I'd like to pose in this reflection is how do we handle suffering? Not just our own personal suffering. We all have a, our own share of that. But also as compassionate pilgrims, we are in a pilgrimage of solidarity. And so we walk in this life with our eyes open, our ears attuned to the cries of suffering humanity, of the people that we meet along the way, the people in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools. We are always hearing the cry. And when we respond to that cry, when we walk into that brokenness of the other person, as a, a Russian theologian, Catherine de Hoc Docherty once said, we get our feet bloodied and our shoulders bloodied as we carry the brokenness and the suffering of other people. When we carry their cross, like Simon and Cyrene carried the cross of Jesus. So we bring all this suffering. How do we handle that suffering? How do we help other people to handle that suffering in a positive way? There are different kinds of sufferings. We, we, I just like to mention briefly a few. There are sufferings which come from the outside as a consequence of the greediness and selfishness or pride of other people. Injustices, slavery, racism, inequalities. There are sufferings which come from broken relationships. We've all experienced that at some time in our life when we have been betrayed in a friendship with someone we confided in and, and, and gave our whole self to then betrays us by sharing that confidence which we shared with them with other people. That hurts. We carry also wounds many times from our past maybe from our family situations, situations when we have been wounded by maybe abuses, uh, dysfunctional families, dysfunctional religious communities. We carry wounds. We carry suffering within us. We also experience sufferings or have seen others suffer because of their faith. When they want to live in a co uh, consequential way. For example, one time I was very good friends with a, an accountant. He had some important people he worked for, and they would ask him always to, you know, to cook the books, you know, to make it look better than it really was for that person, or to cut taxes, which would benefit, of course, the government and consequentially the poor. He suffered with that. How could he? be faithful to his faith and be honest when he needed that work and he couldn't afford to lose it. I remember one time too in another very difficult situation where a young soldier in the time of the military oppression came to me and he spoke to me and shared about how he had been given the order by one of his superiors in the military to take five prisoners out of the jail to take them into the woods and to execute them summarily. And the young soldier told me, I did it. I did it. I knew it was wrong. 
but I'm young, I have a family, I have a baby. And if I would not have done that, what I was ordered to do, I would have been executed by disobeying the order of my officer. So these are situations where people try to be faithful to their faith, but suffer for it. Or those who give their life in conflict situations, like the five adorers of the blood of Christ who gave their life in Liberia during the time of civil unrest, when they were executed by the military or the, those who were taking over the government because they were helping and caring for the wounded of the other side. You know the story of St. Oscar Romero in Salvador, O oh, blessed Father Stan Rother in Guatemala, who gave their lives because they were committed to the poor. Then, of course, we have all the suffering which we encounter constantly at every step of our way of illness, of sickness. The people who are lonely in our elderly homes, that we became aware of this very much in the times of pandemia. Elderly who are separated from their loved ones who have no opportunity to be able to see their families, those who die lonely, alone. The suffering of young and old alike, who because of this pandemic, because of the quarantine and the isolation, many are suffering depression stress. So these, I just wanted to mention a few of the many ways that we experience suffering, the many faces of suffering. Christ was not alien to suffering. Christ became one of us. He became one of us to share our humanity. He shared in all things but sin. And he certainly shared and had his encounters with suffering many times in his life. He suffered when he was not understood by his fellow townspeople. When the people of Nazareth wanted to take him out and throw him over a cliff and kill him. He suffered when when his disciples, whom he was forming, his, his close net group, net, uh, network of disciples and apostles, many times didn't understand. And he would say, are you hard-headed? How many times do I have to tell you? That must have been also a type of suffering that Jesus endured. And he certainly suffered when he was betrayed by some of those closest to him, Judas and Peter, who was to be the rock upon which the church was built. How Peter even denied knowing him. Can you imagine the pain that that must have Jesus. Jesus also suffered when he knew what was coming. He knew that it was, the time had come. He would be betrayed. He would have to undergo hardship, torture, and a terrible death of crucifixion. Stripped naked before the people in the garbage heaps of Jerusalem outside the walls. He knew what suffering was. He knew that what suffering was when he was condemned to death, when the very people he cured, the very people that he fed when he was moved to pity because they were hungry, these very people who some days before wanted to proclaim him king and messiah, these same people were now crying, crucify him, crucify him, and preferred to free a thief and a murderer and take Jesus to the ignominious death of the crucifixion. He knew what it was to suffer that excruciating pain as he hung on the cross. And that solitary moment when he was alone with God. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So Jesus was no stranger to suffering. And so he's no stranger to our suffering. He's been there before. How do we react to suffering? If there's any consolation, we know that even Jesus uh, struggled with it. He was tempted in Gethsemane. Let this cup pass from me, Lord. 
let this cup pass, but then not my will, but yours be done. In the temptations of the devil in the desert, he was tempted by the devil to, to change courses, to, to figure out a different way that he could save us instead of going to Calvary to suffer and die for us. But he resisted. Jesus did not look for suffering either. He wasn't a masochist. But suffering came as a consequence of his options and his choices in life. It's interesting to me, and perhaps we've all wondered sometimes, Jesus said so many beautiful things. He gave us so many lessons in his life. And yet, he never gave us a discourse on suffering. Wouldn't it be great if he would have given us a nice, concise definition why we suffer, why the innocent suffer, tell of what it's all about? He never did that. However, he took on suffering, and he showed us through the way he suffered how we can get through suffering. How do I handle suffering? How do we handle suffering? I remember one case very clearly years ago. A former student of mine now had graduated from our school, our high school. He was a success, very successful student, athlete, very popular person in the university. And how one morning he woke up and he wasn't feeling good within two or three hours, he was dead. When I got home in the evening after my regular work in the parish and I saw a note on my door saying that Stephen had died, I couldn't believe it. I thought, this, you know, it must be a mistake. Finally, I got the nerve up to call the family and I said, is this true? And they told me what happened. I was so dismayed. Not only dismayed, I was angry. I went up to my bedroom and I sat there at my desk and I complained. I was mad at God. Why God? Why Stephen? In the, in the flower of his life, he had everything going for him. Why? And I sat there maybe two hours. I knew that there was a crucifix above my desk, but I would not look at it. I refused to look. I was mad at God. Finally, little by little, I raised my eyes and I contemplated the crucifix. And I said one more time, why, Lord? And that why just sort of hung in the air. And I thought, I'm asking Jesus, why? 33 years old, in the best moment of his life, when all he did was do good for other people, was crucified on that cross and dying, and I asked him, why? And somehow I knew that on that cross was the answer to my question, to the answer to suffering. Suffering can destroy us, and yet suffering can also be redeeming. Let me explain. When we look at the cross, that cross, that I contemplated on the wall. And we sit before the crucifix and look at the Lord, and we read the book of the cross, as some many mystics and people have said in the past, read the book of the cross. On that cross, we see the answer and the way through suffering, to new life. St. Catherine of Siena once wrote that the hands of Jesus are nailed to the cross love. Love is what kept his hands nailed to that cross. That is the secret to redemptive suffering, a way through suffering. Jesus took on our hardship, our suffering for love of us and in order, in order to love and to redeem us, to show us a way through whatever suffering comes along in our life. I've had different experiences in my ministry as a priest. One, especially, I also remember, which 
which was very painful for me because as much as I had attended this person who was dying of cancer, I could not get this person to give himself over to that suffering. They had done everything they could to save him, of course, and all the treatments, but he was going to die. I didn't hide that from him, but he was bitter, he was angry, and he also transmitted that bitterness and that anger to his family. But one of the saddest moments for me was when he died in his bitterness. I was not able to move him beyond that. But at the same time, I had another beautiful experience which I like to share as I end this reflection. I was attending another lady, uh, a mother of one of our, our, our parents at the school, who was dying with brain cancer. I had visited her many times throughout the, her illness, and often I would go and give her the sacrament of the sick, and her family would gather, and we would pray together. And then I would sit with uh, Mrs. Isabel, and we would chat and talk. And toward the end of her life, when she was really going down, her family called me and said, Father Pepe, it's, please come our mother is really nearing the end, and would you please come again and give her the sacrament of the sick? So I went. And after the sacrament of the sick, the family once again left the room, and I sat down with uh, Isabel, and I started talking to her about her death and about the crucifix. And I said, you know, Jesus died on the cross for love of us, and he saves us, not because he died, but because he loved unto death. You can do the same. And I read to her the passage from Colossians, in which it speaks about how we can complete in our flesh the sufferings of Christ. And I talked about this and tried to explain it although I admit that it was hard for me to understand as well. She listened to me very attentively. She never said anything. She didn't respond to that. And when I left that day to go back home or back to the school, I thought to myself, I wonder if Isabel understood anything that I was trying to say. I even said to myself, Pepe, did you understand what you were trying to say? Because this passage has always been very a challenging one for me. To complete in our flesh the sufferings of Christ. Well, about two days later, I was called back once again to the, fam to the family. The mother was dying. She didn't have long at all to live. So we celebrated the sacrament of the sick, and I brought the viaticum, the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist for the journey homebound to heaven. We all received, the whole family was present, gathered around, we prayed, we received communion. And at that moment, during the communion, uh, she began to cry. And when the ceremony was over, and the family once again left the room, and I was alone with Isabel, I sat down next to her and I said, Isabel, why were you crying during the service? Now, I thought I knew the answer. I figured she would tell me, well, this was my last prayer with my family. I'm dying. I won't see them much longer. And she looked up at me and she said, Father Pepe, one of the greatest sufferings I had during my lifetime was the fact that my husband never would accompany me to church. He never accompanied me in any of my activities. And I was very committed as a Catholic. And uh, that was always painful for me. He never opposed that I went, but he never accompanied. And Father, I offered my death for his conversion. This morning, my daughter told me that Last night, my husband went to the local parish and sought out the priest and spoke to the priest and he reconciled himself with God, with the church. And today, Father, 
as we all receive communion together, my last communion, my husband received his first communion. So Father, I was crying during this ceremony, not because I'm sad, not because I'm dying, but because it's the happiest day of my life. Isabel had discovered what the meaning of redemptive suffering is. Instead of destroying her, she found a way through it by following the footsteps of Christ. She took up her cross, she carried it, and she found a way through it to new life. With Christ, she offered her suffering. She completed in her body what was lacking in the sufferings of Christ, and her death became a love offering. Just as the love of God on the cross saved us, through her love offering of her death, her very death, for her husband brought redemption and new life to him. And so it is with all of us as we face different struggles and failures or sufferings in our life, whatever kind of suffering that might be, when we can't get rid of them, the suffering is there, are we going to let it pull us down? Or are we going to, with Christ, find a way through that suffering that it becomes a moment of grace and redemption for us and for others? That is the question I'd like to leave for our reflection. What pains and struggles and sufferings have I experienced in my life? How do I deal with those sufferings? As I pilgrim through life and take on the crosses of other people, how do I help them discover meaning and what they're living and a way through it. How do I live this passage from Colossians? How do I rejoice in my sufferings as united with Christ, we complete in His and our bodies what is lacking in His sufferings for the redemption of the world? God bless you.